Hi, my name is Archana and I'm an experienced designer at Red. Of late, we have been working with clients who have their customers based in three and four tire cities in India. Now, this trend is an important one to note as it represents a huge population that have been untouched by technology yet. This trend is also important for yet another reason as they represent a migrant populations that travel to bigger cities seeking for work. So based on all these things, we began working on a framework that aims to help design applications for the next billion users. And I would love to discuss the top six things in this video that you should keep in mind. To begin with, let's understand who we are designing for a little better. All the descriptions can be debated, but our main objective is to describe the majority of the users. The users may be young or old, but not very tech savvy. Smartphones are the first computing platforms they have handled. They use Android phones. Their income levels could vary quite greatly as this is not a group defined by economics. They seek technical help from other friends and family members. They best understand new ideas through metaphorical comparisons with real world concepts. There are a number of do's and loans to keep in mind. If we went through all of them, it would make a pretty long video. So let's just jump on the top six most important things in the video today. Our very first principle is using permanent positions for objects. In the real world, different objects occupy different spaces, which is starkly different in the digital world where same area of the screen would be occupied by different objects at different times. Now this becomes a huge hurdle for new users to overcome. One way of designing for these kind of users is to allocate space within the screen for certain type of functions. For example, you can allocate the bottom right of the screen for confirmatory actions like OK, Approve, Save, Submit and the other corner of the application for negative actions like Delete, Disapprove, Reject, Cancel. Having a permanent position on the screen for certain type of functions help build relationship between the action and the position. In the long run, it also helps to build muscle memory for the required kind of actions, which may help the user to guess where to tap on the screen that they haven't encountered it yet. The second thing to do is to avoid scrolling. Now, scrolling by itself isn't something that this group of users will find intuitive. If possible, present all the information on multiple screens instead with a progress button that will take them through each of them. But if you must use scrolling, then provide the user with some kind of hint which will allow them to understand that more of the screen is available below. Also make sure that the information on the screen doesn't cut exactly where the physical screen ends. Instead, lay out the screen in such a way where a portion of what's below is speaking above at the bottom of the screen. Another hint that can be provided is to show an illustration of a finger tapping and dragging the screen. The third thing to keep in mind is to use transitions when going between screens. If the same real estate is being used by a different set of information, it helps the user to understand that the same space is being used by a new set of information if you use some sort of transition animations between the screens. For example, if you swipe left, the user will know that the first set of screen have been moved to left to make space for the new screens. In addition, they will also know if they go left, they can see the old screen. What doesn't work here is a quick switch from one screen to another where the user is not allowed to switch context seamlessly. This is one of those principles which actually makes sense for all users and not just this group, but it's essential particularly for this group. It is also recommended to use skeuomorphism. If you haven't heard of this term before, it's a fancy way of saying that the interface should depict real world objects. For example, if there is a need to indicate a delete function, the functionality should be depicted in the form of an icon which resembles an eraser or a trash can as opposed to X, which will make sense to people who have familiarity with technology and not to others. As interface designer, we also need to work hard to build confidence of the digital novices. This brings us to our fifth principle, building user confidence. Now, these kinds of users would be mostly worried about making mistakes, especially when it comes to using applications related to money. It would be good to let them know what they need in order to perform their task. Also, let them know about the steps involved so that they can complete their task. Additionally, messaging on the screen after each task will help the user know that they are doing good. And this will also encourage the user to move step by step in a simple manner. A summary step that indicates all their inputs and decisions before performing the task will be required in order to allay any fears that the user may have. For tasks that requires the users to make multiple decisions, try and keep one decision per screen so that the user can focus on that particular action as accurately as possible. A mini celebration after the task is performed correctly 
will also reinforce the user's confidence in being able to perform it the next time. But the most important tool in the basket is use of voice interfaces. This brings us to the last point in our video today, use voice interface whenever possible. If there's a possibility of using voice interface within an application, the return on investment is extremely high. We frequently underestimate the amount of learning we have gone through while getting used to GUI or touch-based interfaces while tech-savvy users get through these steps pretty easily and seamlessly while it's a big hurdle to learn even the basic functions like scrolling, navigation within the screen, copy-pasting, etc. for users who haven't grown up with technology. But voice interfaces bridges this gap easily and seamlessly. Everybody knows what they want and they can easily put them in words. As designers, we can use technologies like slang or dialogue flow, which allows to infuse voice interface within GUI, creating dual model interfaces. In this way, voice can be assistive and help users to use other applications, even if they are not well versed with GUI based ones. So these are some of the many things to keep in mind while designing for the next billion users. This is by no means meant to be an exhaustive list, but something to get you started in thinking how design can help bridge the technological gap forming in our society. Do you have any other ideas on how design can help? If so, please comment down below or write to us at social at red.in. We'll surely respond to them. I'm Archana from Red Experience Design and we'll see you around soon.